I am showing 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. So to be cognizant of everybody's time, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So good morning, or I should say good afternoon for some of you joining the call today. And thank you all for joining us. Before we proceed, I just wanna take a moment to introduce myself. My name's Shannon Sari, and I am the consultation team lead with the National Rural Health Resource Center, which is providing this webinar today. The Delta Region Community Health Systems Development Program is funded by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy in collaboration with the Delta Regional Authority. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our website following the session today as this will conclude our finance series webinars. Please note there will be a PDF of today's presentation that will be added to the chat box shortly. The finance series does qualify for continuing education credits. So if you would like to receive those credits, Mr. Caleb Lazinski will be sending out an email upon the completion of the webinar series in which you may fill out to receive these credits. In this session, participants will get an overview that really focuses on attributes and strategies of successful rural health clinics throughout the United States. Clinics and specifically RHCs have been an increased area of focus for hospitals given the need to treat patients in outpatient settings. We do ask that you please connect your video feature if you haven't done so already. And if you dialed into the, to today's call, if you press star six, you can unmute your line. You can also communicate through the chat box as Caleb and I will be monitoring. If you haven't already, please take a moment to type your name, title, and organization into the chat box so we know who's joining us today. This really just helps us get a good feel of the audience of the webinar. The National Rural Health Resource Center, also referred to as the center, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving health in rural communities. The center does provide technical assistance, tools, and resources to support rural providers in the five core areas that you see listed on this, the slide. The center is committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. For additional resources, please feel free to visit the center's website. We do have three pre-polling questions we would like you to answer before we get started in today's session. The response options will range anywhere from confident to unconfident. And as Caleb just pulled that up, I'm gonna go ahead and proceed with introducing today's speaker. It is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Opal Greenway, who is a principal at Stroudwater Associates. She is an accomplished healthcare and finance professional who focuses primarily on the strategic needs of healthcare service providers. She's an expert in value, valuations, mergers, as well as accusations, strategy, physician compensation, and regular uh, compliance. I'm now gonna talk, turn it over to Ms. Opal to get us started. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. So talking about RHCs and we're gonna be going over strategic financial and operational best practices. So I'm gonna set some of the context for today um, of, of why we're even talking about this. Go over some of the data as far as what we actually see in characteristics of better performing practices and what are those types of best practices that people are actually executing on to become those better performing practices. And then of course, leaving with some key takeaways. You'll see a lot of information on these slides and um, it's fantastic that we're sending them out PDF because you will actually also see some checklists on there that you guys can use as tools, take home. Don't worry about scribbling down a ton of notes because having the slides, you'll be able to have um, those, some of the different tools we'll talk about at your fingertips after the presentation. 
So setting some of the context, the rural health clinics have been at, have reimbursed at a favorable rate compared to freestanding clinics for years now. However, one of the big things that happened in 2020 was the Consolidated Appropriations Act that changed a significant thing for the rural health clinics reimbursement. And setting an, previously, we were able to have an uncapped rate where we were to roll in some of expenses associated with specialty care and have more hybrid rural health clinics where we were seeing several clients who were able to realize on a cost-based reimbursement $300 per visit, $250 per visit from Medicare and having that um, significant impact to our bottom line by running through th things through the rural health clinic. The change with the Consolidated Appropriations Act has set these actually capped rates for organized for new rural health clinics. So if you are already grandfathered in, great, you get your continued rate as long as you're continuing to monitor your costs. But for everyone else, looking at this past year getting 113 visits per dollars per visit and next year $126 per visit, the need to actually be focusing on your operational management for the clinics has never been more, uh, more important. We don't have, even if you were grandfathered in, you don't have necessarily the same luxury that you have of understanding how do I need to run the practice in a very optimized way and still be able to do better in this RHC setting. So recognizing that rule change and a lot of us, how have we been adjusting to that? What are some of the things that, frankly, in my experience, I've taken away from actually running practices that have been owned by hospitals, ones that have been owned by physicians that have been acquired and what are the things that drive that operational performance and how do they apply to RHCs? So realistically, for a lot of clinics that we see when hospitals oftentimes, they buy up practices based off of a physician maybe in the community or a group of physicians in the community and say, we don't wanna run the clinic anymore. We're tired of the business piece of it. We wanna see patients, right? That's what I went to medical school for. I don't have my business degree. I'm not you know, getting bogged down into the business of healthcare. I wanna see patients. So hospital, we have a great relationship. Will you buy my practice? That really is how many hospitals have ended up owning a lot of clinics. Some have started their clinics. Even when a hospital starts its own clinic though, clinics are run very differently than the med surge floor. They operate differently. There's, even if they're within the four walls of the hospital and say they're attached, they're still run differently and what patients expect. And recognizing that key difference is part of the reason why we see so many clinics struggle, especially coming after under hospital acquisition. People are left pondering, hey, I bought this practice. The physician had it take home income. Obviously the practice was doing well and was profitable for a number of years. Why all of a sudden when it comes underneath the hospital, is it not making money anymore? And so understanding those differences is actually key to grounding what do we need to do better operationally to drive the financial performance in the clinics. It starts out actually with strategy of why are we buying a practice to begin with? So is it, are we being opportunistic where a physician has said, hey, will you buy my practice? And we're like, we better jump on it because we want to maintain the referrals and that strong relationship and keep those patients. We better buy this practice. Or is it part of a long-term medical staff development plan of saying, we want to expand primary care in our organization um, for us. You know, if, if we're going to expand primary care, we need to have four more physicians and three nurse practitioners over the next four years. Oh, look, here is a clinic that we know we have a strong relationship with that um, they might, maybe we should approach them. Maybe we should talk to them about what their long-term plan is. How can we have that strong alliance? That would be a more strategic perspective of how we get practices within our system rather than the opportunistic way. So that long-term planning allows us to consider what are the other resources? If I'm going to expand family practice, right, and buy up this clinic, that means I may not have the resources, especially the personnel to do the integration of buying up a general surgery practice or an orthopedic practice, right? We have in our communities, we have those competing resources. So rather than being opportunistic, being strategic. Once we actually buy up a practice, oftentimes there's a significant infrastructure change. All of a sudden the staff may be on the hospital benefits plan, as opposed to in a lot of independent practices, they may not be getting the same level of healthcare benefits as you do in the hospital. You have an IT investment. We, we put them on an integrated EHR system, as opposed to maybe they're currently on all scripts, 
right, um, of what we see from a physician. And very few of my uh, the hospitals I work with are on all scripts, which is the number one for the physicians. Also, you've taken out of the practice any ancillary revenue that was historically in the practice is now usually done at a hospital. And so when you move that revenue over onto the hospital side and it no longer shows up on the financials of the clinic, you all automatically see, oh, wait a minute, the clinic's not making as much money. Realistically, that those services are still being performed, the revenue is just showing elsewhere. So understanding what are you looking at from an apples to apples um, perspective. Understanding what consolidation is appropriate versus not appropriate, right? Oftentimes organizations will say, okay, we just let the clinic continue to run itself as, as is, and we don't do any sort of consolidation um, and designation planning. Should we be an RHC? Should we put multiple RHCs together? What are they hitting their productivity thresholds, et cetera? And we keep them separate. So that separation can actually hurt financial performance. Or we over consolidate and we bring everything out of the clinic, including maybe the call center. We're going to do centralized scheduling. We're going to do centralized billing. And now providers don't get the feedback, immediate feedback that they need for certain pieces of this. And we have operational issues. Okay. We oftentimes, what we see, one of the biggest things for our clinics is no standards and measures. So clinic A might be primary care and is run one way. Clinic B is also primary care and somebody else is in charge of it. There's no, the staffing aren't trained the same way. They operate however they need to within the four walls of that specific clinic. And so with the staffing shortages that we have, we don't have the ability to move wor um, workers between different clinics and provide services. And that lack of that standardization for the things that are appropriate causes us to have a significant number of inefficiencies. Understanding the role of the clinic, the people in the clinic in revenue cycle is a key piece that's driving operational performance. Oftentimes hospitals have revenue cycle report to finance and treat the people who are doing the billing and coding or cannot within the clinic anymore. The real, the, when that happens, your front desk people who in the clinic have a significant impact on what revenue cycle is going to look like are no longer part of the training that happens. They no longer understand their role in the financial management of a clinic. They're thinking they're pay checking in patients and not thinking about how we check in patients impacts the revenue cycle. So all of these different pieces, when you add them up together, the consequences is hospitals really just host practices rather than actually actively run and manage them. Okay, and so when we do that, it creates some significant losses and we're used to seeing, okay, people think, oh, I have to subsidize primary care, I'm having a loss in my clinic. And realistically, what we see for RHCs, that that doesn't have to be the case when you address this. The other regulatory changes that have been happening, some of them have existed for a while, but it's really driving what the performance of the clinics is this, the Stark and anti-kickback laws. And one of the big things when you buy up a practice, what is the thing that changes? Provider compensation. A provider, primary care physician might've been making $170,000, $200,000 when they were take home running their own clinic. The hospital buys them up and they need to get them into what's fair market value, provider share information. They're like, oh, primary care doctors are making $240,000. I want, when you buy at my practice, I want an employment agreement that is equitable compared to all the rest of the family practice providers that the hospital also employs. So now that clinic where that provider might be taking 170, 180 home, now wants 240. Now, obviously now this clinic has an additional $60,000 of expense. Under the change of the regulations, if you can't pass that increase in compensation all the way through into your costs and coming into your reimbursement model, you need to figure out how am I going to make up that additional compensation now that I need to pay the provider? How can I make up the additional expense for the staff benefits? How can I make up the additional expense for my IT conversions within the clinic if I can't pass through that cost that I've been doing? Right. So understanding what it, like the compensation aspects and how to fit it within the Stark law and commercial reasonableness are really important things for understanding how to have those conversations with providers and where it fits into the overall operational performance of the clinic. So let's talk about what do we see in somebody who's doing what we consider doing well for our practices. There's some very key attributes that we see time and time again for the our clinics that are doing well. One is the fact that it starts out with organize, like how it's organized and what the strategy is. Okay, 
understanding did you have go through an actual strategic plan and medical staff development planning of understanding how does this clinic actually drive forward the organization's overall strategy what does it fit into it right moving away from just being opportunistic and one of the key things is, is when you can actually point to this clinic and say here's how it fits into this strategy it allows you to actually have engagement with the providers the staff the nurses within that clinic so that they understand their role in moving the organization and the health system forward and that level of engagement actually greatly impacts operations because they can tie what they do on an individual day-to-day -day basis and understand decision making that happens outside of the clinic why do you want me to be starting to run these reports why do i need to see 24 patients per day why you know why do i need to pay attention to new patients versus established patients when and under an RHC, I'm just getting the same rate. Why does it matter that I'm doing these pieces? Is understanding how do they fit into that organization's strategy? And what is the, does the clinic have a culture that fits in with the hospital's culture? We often see go into organizations where there is an us versus them mentality. That us versus them mentality always have poor performing clinics. If the CEO of the hospital never shows up in the clinic ever and summons people from the clinic to come to the hospital, even for things of saying, hey, we want to show our appreciation, come and get a cookie or a pizza or like, you know, something over at the hospital, the clinic oftentimes is in the position where like, wait, so we have to shut down the clinic to be able to send people over to go and show that they're being appreciated. And now we need to make this up. Thinking through those types of things and that organizational culture always impacts overall operations. So those that are doing well take those pieces into consideration. When it comes to the actual operations, we actually see organizations provide a good amount of clinical support staff to improve the provider efficiency. They're thinking about top of license performance and saying, okay, what do I need? Do I need to make, and again, this pre-pandemic, should I go ahead and invest an additional MA if it allows my physician to see four more patients per day and understanding, okay, that's worth that kind of investment, as opposed to, you know, provider asking for an additional MA, wait a minute, that's going to cost money, you know, and not doing that full analysis of understanding how do we maximize the provider's efficiency and understanding maybe the provider's asking for an MA because the provider is pausing doing clinical work to go and room a patient themselves. It's amazing how much we're actually seeing that provide where providers are a very expensive resource to be doing the process of rooming a patient. When you think about nurse practitioner costing $130,000 versus an MA, maybe $40,000 and they're rooming patients. Which gets at to the fact that when you're doing operational decisions like that, is it data driven? Are you looking at the actual numbers associated with that those decisions versus are you making different assumptions about what you're doing in operations? And then how are you sharing that data? Are you sharing it with the providers to explain your decisions? It's no surprise that better performing clinics, we actually see that they do have higher productivity and staff output, right? You're, you're running things efficiently. One, I mentioned the compensation. The reason why compensation and that stark and anti kickback is important is because in high performing clinics, provider compensation is directly tied to the performance of the clinic, whether it's productivity, whether it's quality, whether it's patient panel size, the providers are at the at a level of risk when it comes to their compensation for the actual performance of that clinic by some specific metric. We actually see staff being incentivized by practice performance and bonuses being paid out, even small ones for actual staff, as opposed to them just being compensated on an hourly basis, where regardless of how well they perform their job, here's how much that they make. Organizing um, clinics that are doing better, there is val like that value-based mentality that exe exists within the clinic. Quality of care and the cost of safety are always paramount to the operations of the clinic, that there's no decisions that are being made without understanding what the quality component of that is and that it, we're coming at it from a very patient and community mindset. It's not always, and the, everyone within the clinic has that mindset. Even when the providers talk about compensation, you can tie it to how does this impact the community and the patients? When you talk to the clinical staff of like, okay, we're gonna change this workflow process. How does that impact the community and the patients? If those are at the key focus of every decision that is made and you can tie it directly and understanding that, 
we see practices performing better. Obviously, a key attribute is what we can define a better performing clinic as, as one that is has profitability, right? It has superior financial performance. So what does that look like from a numbers perspective? Okay, we see that overall in rural we um, practices, obviously they don't have sometimes the same level of revenue associated with them that some of the more metropolitan areas have, whether, and this information here is on a per provider basis. But when we're looking at it, we all, so what I'm showing here is we look at all practices versus what we see in rural and what we see from the perform, better performing. When you think about what you're, what you're targeting as a practice, having the information of, okay, what is a better performing practice doing? People assume that the better performing practices all must be in the metro areas, right? You have all the patients, you have access to all, you know, the information, you have access to providers. That's what is, that's what's happening. That I have to say, that's not always the case. And part of that is because of specifically RHCs and their enhanced reimbursement that they've been getting we actually see RHCs among our better performing practices on a regular basis, right? They're able to actually, they might have lower provider costs than an urban market and that focus on, and that pass through of expenses that they've had historically, they can actually be better performing practices. But it's going to take some of that very disciplined practice management to be able to get there. So one of the things that we see is people think, okay, in rural, we don't have access to staff. Well, one of the things we noticed actually is our better performing practices on a per FTE ratio actually are running efficiently enough that when you look at it from a clinical support staff of, of how many per, um, clinical support staff people per APP that they're having, actually the better performing practices have, or will have lower ratios. And it's really because of the efficiencies and the standardization that they have, that they're able to operate with less clinical support staff um, than, what, than what you're actually seeing in just rural or overall. So understanding that there, it, it is possible to gain those efficiencies is what's really helpful for organizations right now that are thinking, oh my goodness, we're so understaffed and we're so, um, is, you know, there's no way we can get to a better performing practice because there's no staff to hire. Realistically, changing operational workflows can help you move into some of this higher performance that we're seeing. Okay. One of the big things though, as I have to point out is noticing the difference over here on this right column, if you can see my cursor, that better performing practices are seeing over 600 work RVUs more than what we're seeing in rural. And the reason why I wanna point that out is because with rural health clinics specifically, we have seen a mentality shift of paying attention to the revenue cycle and the work RVU process, right? They're thinking, okay, we've trained our providers to assume knowing that they're gonna get a, a certain dollar, you know, $200 per visit, regardless of what kind of visit type that is. And it's going to be an all-inclusive rate. And so lack of attention to what's going on with work RVUs and not actually compensating providers associated with some sort of productivity, we're actually seeing rural health clinics fall behind with regards to their overall productivity metrics. Okay. And what we've seen is, you know, a lot of organizations coming out of COVID, they took advantage of the waivers associated with the thresholds. They're trying to figure out how can they get back to those meeting those thresholds um, on a consistent basis and also paying attention to what's going on the commercial side where work RVUs are a more relevant metric. So that lack of attention is part of how we've seen this gap significantly widen over the past couple of years. So let's talk about how we get there, right? And we get to becoming one of those better performing practices. I mentioned previously the organization and strategy. It all starts with leadership, including physician leadership, right? Providing that strategic direction and having it go all the way into the clinic. And with our rural health clinics, while a lot of us run our rural health clinics very much in an APP focused manner. So I want you guys to be able to kind of use, when I say physician or provider, I'm talking about both providers in general. So advanced practice providers and physicians. 
What I see in some organizations, though, is they'll have physicians involved in organizational leadership and strategic direction, but not necessarily a place for the APPs. When we think about APPs, though, and they're, how critical they are to the success of our rural health clinic, it doesn't really make sense to not include them in helping drive what is the overall organizational strategy. So when we look at our organization and we look at the clinics, we need to pay attention to who is leading our clinic. If it is an APP who is there all of the time, even if it, they're only required to be half time for regulatory purposes, realizing if an APP is really the one who is providing leadership in that clinic, how do they fit and how are they communicating with organization leadership to see how they fit into that, right? So are they participating in strategic planning? Are they making sure that the clinic is part of that strategic planning process? where we know we're starting with you know, a shared purpose, it goes through leadership, it, it shows up in strategic planning, how all things fit, practice meant in that way we can have efficient communication about that strategic plan and where we fit into it with practice managers and providers and have the bi-directional communication. So you see the two arrows that go back and forth here between these two bubbles is those practice ma managers and the providers need to be able to give feedback, including the data to have that data-driven decision-making as to whether or not we're actually executing strategy. So that bi-directional communication and collaboration is key. Well, they're the ones who also inter interact with staff. So you might not have your staff be participating on the strategic planning process, but the staff having bi-directional communication between practice managers and providers is key for actually feeding this fee chain of having it being an iterative process of how our operations actually executing that strategic vision that we have and be able to drive that cohesion. Okay. One of the key pieces with how we get there is making sure that when we think about our overall organizational strategy and where the clinics fit into this organizational strategy, are we actually grounding it in the quintuple aim? So I mentioned previously that our better performing practices when they come up with their strategy have value at the heart of every one of their decisions, that they can tie what is the value that is being driven from this decision, from this change in process, from this workflow, from this specific clinic. And so being able to tie it into the quintuple aim, especially as reimbursement changes, and we have more organizations that are going to a risk-based model where the primary care practice in our rural health clinics are so key to each one of these pieces of the quintuple aim, quintuple aim right? So we know that care coordination that starts in the rural health clinic drives better outcomes. It's a lower cost setting for us to be able to provide that care as long as we're running it efficiently, okay? Tying that connectivity with the providers themselves in the workforce, it gives them an improved work provider and workforce experience, which is critical right now with burnout and losing how many people that we've lost from healthcare this year, um, in the past couple of years, impacts that patient experience. We've also seen recently, um, and I know it's a big initiative of the center, of how this is actually impacting equity and inclusion. One of the big things that it ties right to for financial performance is the clinic is one of the key places where we can advance the equity of our communities of making sure the entire community is being cared for and, understand, and understands the role of the clinic in their healthcare so that we can reduce ED utilization and making sure we can drive an overall health of our community as opposed to a subset of the community or frankly, doing more of a sick care model. So having each of these different pieces at the heart of, of strategy and then moving into operations and understanding where the clinic fits into each one of these buckets is going to help us actually drive operational performance for that clinic. But are there key components of strategy that you should already, that you need to start talking about if you're not already, okay? One of the key pieces though is also when we move from that biggest picture, right, of organizational strategy, it moves down into right the provider complement. What are the providers that we need to provide the services that our community needs? What does that look like? Is it physicians versus APPs? Is it licensed clinical social workers? Is it midwives? Is it CRNAs? Understanding what your actual provider complement is starts out with understanding, okay, who do you currently have? Who is aligned? What is their level of engagement and alignment? 
Are they owned practices and employed practices? Do you have independent practices that you have good partnerships? What is your level of alignment? Do you have contractual government, government and financial alignment with independent practices? If you want to expand a service because you do the community needs assessment and you, did, you actually used your community health needs assessment instead of just checking an IRS box, that you have to have it, you actually use it to say, okay, here's where we're going to, these are the services my community needs, how should we provide that? Does it mean, hey, I want to expand pulmonology, like our community needs a 0.3 FTE pulmonologist, how can I potentially buy that service from a tertiary partner to send somebody to work in my rural health clinic a few days a week to meet my community need, right? So tying that community health needs assessment to your provider complement to have an actual strategy of understanding is this something I need to buy and I actually there's a large enough need that I need to employ these um, providers and have this in my rural health clinic versus is this something that I'm going to I can build it through my different um, partnerships that I have with independents or is this something that I actually need to get from outside of the community and bring on a part-time basis Understanding also, especially when it comes to independent practices, is what are the competencies and the demand, um, the supply that can service that kind of demand. So with your independent practices, oftentimes it's really hard to understand how exactly productive they're being. You don't necessarily have access to their data um, and whether or not they're working on a full-time basis. Are they seeing how many patients are they seeing a day? So understanding what your alignment is with those independent practices to be able to do a real comparison of what, what do you see from a demand basis in your community health needs assessment, what's actually coming into your hospital and where is it being referred from? So one of the big key data metrics that we're seeing in RHCs that are not being tracked very well is the referral patterns, right? Oftentimes organizations are saying, okay, they go to the providers and saying, what are you referring out? And that, and that's the basis for, okay, you know, my providers tell me they need ortho. They need, they're referring out a lot of ENT. It would be great if we could get an ENT physician coming into the RHC two days a month, right? Or two, maybe it's just one day a month of, of, and two blocks, right? For a full day. As opposed to actually, hey, if this is something that we need to do to understand what is the appropriate provider complement how can we track this referral information? Are we actually looking at our patient charts and saying, okay, the physician says, hey, um, I'm going to refer, a primary care physician is going to refer you to this specialist to go look at, and are we getting the information back? If it's not all in network, we see organizations not track that information to really, and then utilize it for understanding what their provider complement needs to be, right? Once you get through, okay, that's how many providers we need, and this is how the providers need to be, um, what referrals, what specialists we need access to, how many primary care providers we have, we then put them in the clinic, right? So getting into kind of day-to-day -day operations, but who's leading the clinic, all right? Realistically, right now, especially in this, quote, post-pandemic environment where we have reduced staffing, most of the time, the person who is leading our clinic is wearing multiple hats. It might be your lead nurse, your lead MA. And that lead MA is actually working full-time as an MA within the practice, as well as maybe the clinic manager, right? But what I'm seeing from because, um, even before the pandemic, before we had those kinds of stressors, we actually still had a situation where we would make somebody, here's the clinic manager. But realistically, that person was really operating more as a supervisor. They got promoted from being, hey, this is the MA that's been here the longest and within my clinic, or the nurse has been the, there the longest, or maybe they were the one who was leading the clinic when the physician owned it. And so we just have them continue to do their job, and we don't provide them any sort of training or any metrics to define the success of how well they're performing their job. So we see them acting as a supervisor. They check the, bo the boxes of, they monitor the schedule. Somebody calls them sick, they figure out who's supposed to be in there. They understand, all right, here's our budget and here are the variances to budget. And they hand you the, and they hand finance the report that says, all right, ex you know, supply expense went up this amount. Here's how many initial, um, um, based off of last year, here's how many immunizations I need to order this year. It's really just that supervision type role of 
they're just overlooking things and making sure things are running smoothly and like and putting out fires when they're popping up versus what I really consider good practice management is somebody who is thinking about how is this clinic driving strategy forward. I'm actually focusing on executing a strategic plan. I'm looking for what is the culture of the clinic and how and what is the communication that needs to happen? What is my part in making sure this communication ha ha um, happens? I'm thinking forward and I'm anticipating problems. We're going to roll out a new population health initiative. We brought in a care coordination nurse who's going to integrate with our ACO and the RHC and is going to be tracking this information and, you know, um, this nurse that has been working in the clinic is now going to be the pop health nurse half time. Wait a minute, this is going to have these downstream impacts. If I do that, how am I going to fill in those gaps? So a true manager of a clinic is thinking about those types of gaps and like anticipating and, and going through in a very solutions focused problem solving. That's something that people are usually don't come in with on day one. Right, unless you're actually able to go out and hire a good, an experienced practice manager, that's something that people usually need to be trained to do. And we're like, well, we don't have time to train people to do this. Take it. What we have seen is organizations that will take the time to actually invest in their clinic managers to do that kind of training actually have improved outcomes and performance within their clinics. The ROI of that training is is significantly faster. So somebody who sits in a supervisor role oftentimes will not move the needle for years within that clinic. Doing front end training and what I typically see is um, what from what we can actually do from in this post pandemic and the like the how much time we actually have of people is if we will actually invest in usually it's a half day every other week of that kind of training on a you know a small amount but a consistent cadence of that training for that supervisor within three months of that additional training that that provider is getting or that um, supervisor is getting, they can start actually working and we're seeing it move the needle from a management perspective. They're actually able to think about improvements and start to address even workflow efficiencies and productivity in the RHCs are going up when they do that training. So really that cost benefit analysis is showing that the, that training is one of the biggest things we can do to drive that performance from where we are now to moving into those better performing clinic um, categories. I mentioned previously, all right, how do we go about decision making? It really needs to be data driven. Well, to be able to have data driven decision making, one, you have to be able to get the data. Two, the data needs to be getting in the hands of the right people. Those people need to understand how to interpret the data and, and they need to engage with it on a regular enough basis to be able to make decisions off of it. And um, that cadence needs to be at a frequency in which, okay, they can see trends and make informed decisions on a real time basis, as opposed to, hey, they get a report once a year, right? And then they don't think about it again. It's especially if it's a report that, well, we know that the reason why there that variance is we had an increase back in April, you know, we're working on next year's budget. Well, we knew we had an increase in April. So let's just stick the, keep the budget that same because April was a one off, as opposed to looking at things on a more regular basis and understanding what we're looking at, that we could have made a real time adjustment to understand, is that really just April or are there other things that are going? On? So key things I, I have on here, a little checklist of key data pieces that should be in a dashboard that both management leaders and providers should actually be engaging with on a regular basis. So understanding, of course, the organizational strategies and goals. It's amazing how many clinics I go into that actually have never seen their organization's strategic plan. So of course they have no idea where they fit into it. Um, and if you ask them like, what is the hospital doing? They don't know. They're like we're just, we're, we're doing our day-to-day -day business. We're seeing patients and, that, and that's what we're supposed to do. They don't necessarily know how is the practice performing on a standalone basis. And I will say in here of, of helping people understand what is the overall practice performance, it needs to be of a objective, here's what is going on, as opposed to it is very negative when they're like, why, why are you guys losing so much money, right? There's a, a healthy way of engaging with data that drives solution focus versus creating and reinforcing an us versus them mentality of, hey, answer for the clinic losses, what, what's going on with that? 
actually getting information about what is going on with staff engagement and staffing. You know, what are the staffing levels? What is that level of engagement? Who is participating on what committees? What it, have you done a regular um, providers, both provider and employed staff engagement survey? What was the last result of that? What have you done with an employment survey since then as far as what are the key findings and, and what initiatives are you doing to address and increase overall satisfaction? Having information with regards to the scheduling and the patient throughput. So on here, so I mentioned previously, right? Building supervisors up to managers. Here's a list, a checklist of what really needs to be on a finance and operations dashboard that a practice manager actually needs to engage with on a regular basis. So when you look through all of these different pieces, you can imagine that your lead nurse or your lead MA who gets um, promoted up to a clinic supervisor has probably never looked at several of these pieces. So if you just give them a dashboard with all of this information on there, they might be familiar with no-show rates, cancellations, staff ratios. Most of them have probably never looked at a CPT code distribution, right? And of understanding where are you on that kind of bell curve? Do you have potential undercoding or overcoding situations? They've probably never seen that information. So th this is an example of why that training is so important. And what I would do is if you were going to think about, okay, how do I go about training somebody to be a better practice manager as opposed to just a supervisor is you just pick one or two of these ratios, one or two of these pieces of data and work with them to fully understand that and then tie it to decision making, right? Why do I look at CPT code distribution? I look at CPT code distribution to understand what is the level of QD I'm, of patients I'm seeing in an objective way as opposed to maybe a provider thinks that I've got all the sick patients. How do is it that I have all the Medicaid sick patients and somebody else gets, you know, a more balanced patient panel. Those CPT code distributions can help actually explain that. And maybe we use it now to adjust what our scheduling template is, right? Of how many sick visits versus well visits we need to put. How many ED follow-ups do we need to make sure are on our um, scheduling templates? So making sure that they understand they're looking at a full picture of data, but understand how should they utilize this data to drive decision-making. Okay. A key piece is then also that provider engagement. So we had our, we've started out with strategy. We look at our provider complement. We look at who's running the clinic. We have to talk to the providers themselves and what their role is in, um, in operations. I am one of those people. I am not a clinician. I am never going to tell a physician of how to see a patient and here's what a diag you know, here's how you should diagnose your patient. However, I can provide them with information to see, okay, here's what we see out in the industry. Here's what we see with other RHCs. Here's what we see within our own clinic of your fellow providers, right? Within our clinic, have this information and give it to them on a regular basis. Most organizations think physicians only want to know the work RVUs. And then maybe they only get to provide them the work RVUs or the number of patient visits because it's tied to their compensation, right? If that's the case, though, it's incomplete information to the provider. One, that the, providing only that information is oftentimes based on the assumption that physicians don't want to see any of the financial information. In our experience, that's not true. Providers like seeing the full picture because they under, they like when they have the information of saying, okay, this is why we're making this decision. Here's where revenue is. Here's where expenses are. Here's how many work RVUs I'm at. And here's how this has been changing comparatively over the months. Right. So when you want to go talk to a provider of, hey, let's brainstorm about how we can see the clinic can see three more patients per week, because if we see three more patients per week, it will drive revenue this amount. And if that happens, then we can afford an additional staff or we can do this. Right. Having that data in front of the providers helps them actually come up with solutions. Another key piece of this is if you're going to move providers towards the best practice of compensation, having a productivity component, they need to be able to see that information in a real time way of at least on a monthly basis of, OK, here's how what's driving that performance. So you'll see on here where I say work reviews, visits and charges broken out into categories. Right. What is my office visit distribution? What is surgery? What is going into ancillary? What's imaging, et cetera? So providers and even new patient versus established patient of saying, okay, well, last month you had this many new patients 
and your work RVU distribution was X. This month, right, you're concerned about, hey, why did my work RVUs get lower? And, it sh and you show, here's the comparison of new versus established patients. This might be why. How do we need to adjust your template or what can we do to be able to make sure you're on a more consistent basis or on track for what you're trying to achieve as a provider and as an organization, right? Within the overall clinic operations, having certain standardizations is absolutely critical for that really imp um, improved efficiencies. And those standardizations, I wanna be clear, it does not mean one size fits all. People will think about that as, okay, every clinic just needs to be cookie cutter and every RHC operates the same way. You need to be able to have that kind of flexibility for providers to practice medicine in, their own, in, in the way that they do but understanding what also the organization needs and how it impacts other processes. So for example, you're not gonna standardize and say primary care should be the same as um, specialty care. In a rural health clinic, you might have both primary care and some specialists located in that RHC. Recognizing that, then the front desk needs to understand as well as the providers, why do appointment blocks look differently? Did we standardize everybody to be the same way? Or did we make sure that there was a difference between, hey, primary care needs to be on this, you know, 2040 versus a specialist that is visiting the clinic is going to be on a 1530 template. So where are there differences and do we have the logic as to why there needs to be a difference and how does that impact other processes? So when we look at um, scheduling, right, one of the important things is that the fact that patients, even, even in rural communities, will say that they will switch doctors if they have overly long wait times. So are, are we measuring the data associated with that, right? Do we get patients from a door to doc time in under 20 minutes? What is our scheduling for being able to get non-urgent and non-emergent um, non patients and those immediate appointments actually on our calendars, right? What is still, what is being handled by phone versus what is being handled by technology? So making sure from a scheduling perspective, are we tracking the right things and making sure that we can actually are moving towards best practice. One of the things that I do is, okay, if, if we've never measured some of this stuff, you start out with like, let's just set a baseline. What is our current wait time from door to doc, right? Or door to provider for the clinic. And then track that for the next, let, let's just say, let's, let's track it for the next month. Where are we right now? What would a 10% improvement look like? And what would that take? Rather than jumping all the way to median, so say your current wait time, uh, a clinic I was recently in was like 37 minutes, okay, significant, and they had some shortages. But when we looked at it, we're like, okay, if we wanted to reduce that just by three minutes and get to 34 minutes, what does our process look like and what can we adjust to find those three minutes to be able to have a better wait time. And we track it for the next couple of months. And we share that information with the people who are actually doing the day-to-day -day work and are involved in that process, because they're the ones who oftentimes come up with the ideas of, hey, I could do this differently. I could, you know, I could, here's how I do check-in. Here's where I can make sure that where it shows up on the screen that I've checked somebody in, that the back, that the nurse in the back knows that that patient is available, ready to be seen. Right, how is that getting prompted? And that being said, also looking at with regards to staffing and are we, how are we utilizing our staff and where do they fit into each one of these processes? So here's a, this is the current state practice environment, although I will say I was just in West Virginia and the legislation they were hoping to pass um, at some point this year to become actually a full practice state. Recognizing how you can use your APPs is absolutely critical right now on a state by state basis. But one of those key things that I wanna point out is oftentimes pay attention to not just, hey, what is my state rule for my license of practice for APPs, but what's in my payer contracts? Because the payer contracts, just evaluate your top three payers, they tend to actually be more restrictive than the state licensing for how you're actually able to utilize those different APPs. So before you change any workflows or change the supervision, et cetera, make sure you want to understand the full impact. Is this going to have a revenue impact? Because a lot of payer contracts will have a provision in there of saying, okay, you can use an APP, but it will be reimbursed at this lower rate if you don't document it this way. 
you gotta love those gotcha clauses on the payer contracts, um, which I'm sure every CFO who might be on this call right now is being like, yep, I'm familiar with those and they're a pain and, um, I, and I haven't worked at them in five years. Um, so just making sure you understand that for, and that the people who are thinking about process changes or how to utilize their APPs are making sure they touch base with finance and revenue cycle to make sure that they understand that they're not about to make a change that's going to have a significant revenue impact. One tool that I utilize a lot for um, organizations is this time motion analysis example I have on here. It's just following a physician for 30 minutes, right, or, or a provider for 30 minutes and seeing how they actually spend every, every minute of that 30 minutes. What are they doing? What did they did they do a patient workup? They looked for a nurse, they made a phone call, they did an examination, they did charting, et cetera, and finding out what was wasted, what could they delegate, where can we move things around? And doing this, I start out with doing it with a provider to see because we think top of license. Then we do it with the nursing staff, then we do it with the front desk staff and seeing how they're actually spending their time. And you do this a couple of times, and then you might just have somebody actually just keep a time log off to the side of their desk and be able to do that, it helps you identify where that waste might be happening to identify, can I see three more patients in a week? If we actually, re if we took out some of the wasted time, how can we do this and actually have drive that operational improvement for the clinic? So this is a really key tool that is real well worth it to do that time motion analysis to see how much time, and then you expand it over like in the example I'm using here, you can see that waste time it's 2.6 hours per day. Well, think about how many patients you could see or how much the physician could actually finish their charting that day instead of taking it home if we weren't spending this amount of time, you know, doing things that are not that are outside of the scope of how we're trying to be able to see patients and what we would consider ideal operations. So really key tool for driving that kind of per operational performance better. Staff, um, when we look at staffing, and how they're spending that time, this becomes all that more important given what we're seeing in staffing right now, okay? And the fact that we have shortages, not just of providers, not just of what we're seeing people coming out of medical school and what it takes to recruit those providers, that staffing is happening actually throughout the whole organization. And we're seeing even, and we're losing MAs to like Amazon distribution centers, right? I've seen that in the number one, a number of the rural communities I work in or the, the gig economy, et cetera. So, when we look at that, um, one of the things I do, do to work with staffing, um, especially on the provider side, is using a physician action council where that physician action council is actually involved in what's going on with the staffing levels, especially with providers and how they interact throughout to understand that being able to have good staffing and good retention, that those providers actually, that action council, hits three different key areas in addition, because most people think of a physician action council of just handling quality. Okay, if there's a patient complaint or a bad outcome, they work on it as a group of providers. But realistically, a physician action council, if you have them involved in understanding and setting compensation, what compensation strategy is, being involved in the retention, so very much the provider engagement, making sure um, that somebody is onboarded correctly, understanding, um, where where the mentorship that happens for their colleagues, et cetera, are, as well as recruitment, those organizations will drive better success and especially understanding how the RHC fits into these different pieces, right? That oftentimes I've seen a physician action council um, in a lower performing organization, they'll focus on recruitment of specialists and retention of the specialists and not actually integrate how does the RHC fit into this, um, this overall setting. And they, and they lack, and then the big area where I see that really impacting is the RHC is not being involved enough in understanding what the recruitment needs are for the organization. Again, going back to the, that referral um, information. With uh, better performing practices, paying attention to the finance and revenue cycle is absolute key. So I mentioned previously, right, we see over consolidation within practices of saying, okay, we've bought up 10 practices, all the revenue cycle is coming in house. Okay. One of the key pieces, though, is that we said is on the finance and revenue cycle side, when they do that, it divorces it from the operations of the clinic. And so 
key piece of it is when we're looking at revenue cycle is where does it fit into what happens in the day-to-day -day aspect of the clinic and how are we measuring that? Are you measuring something such as cost to collect, right? So HFMA has really great resources with regards to what is a, some good data of where should you be on your cost to collect and understanding though all the components that go into that cost of collection, right? It's not just patient accounting and HIM, et cetera. It's the full cost associated with that, including what is going on in the clinic. If you're having your clinic people doing any sort of collection um, payments, et cetera, right? Like if they are asking patients on the front end of when they check in, hey, here's, here's your outstanding patient balance. Where is that actually taken into consideration from a revenue cycle and understanding what that data in, um, is and how it fits into the process? So revenue cycle is really defined all the way from pre-claim all the way to the back end. Unfortunately, when it comes to clinics, people have a tendency to focus on these four, these other um, buckets of claim submission, inbound processing, and AR management. They're forgetting, as you can see, pre-claim, pre-visit, and the visit itself. Where does that stuff happen? Especially pre-visit and visit. All of this is happening in the RHC itself. And so if you don't have the RHC actually be part of revenue cycle committees or revenue cycle council or those regular meetings, if somebody from the RHC is not participating in that, you're missing all this front end piece that frankly pushes everything that happens on the back end side of things. So if your scheduling and registration isn't going well, if you're not doing your prior authorizations, if you're not focusing on your coding and your charge cap capture, none of this back end stuff really matters. So having a revenue cycle management mentality in the RHC is absolutely critical for driving your operational performance. So the next couple of slides, I'm not going to go through these because I'm just giving this to you as a tool to take home, right, is I have a to do list for you. OK, of making because I want to leave some time. I know we have some questions. We only have five minutes remaining. These this checklist is go through this with your revenue cycle team and understand where do each of these pieces fit within the RHC itself? Do you have them integrated in there and have somebody from the RHC participating? All right. So in closing out with regards to operations so we can get to some questions and polling is we tend to think about RHCs and operational about productivity. How many patients are we seeing a day, each day, et cetera? Are we sharing that information with them, okay, with the people? And understanding it's usually it's not about working harder because I oftentimes see we just need to see more patients, right? Of understanding all the things that impact productivity will help you actually think through of working smarter and driving that operational performance for your RHC. So what is the non-provider clinical work that's happening, that's going on? What are our ratios? Are we giving, are we actually incentivizing people based off of that performance? Are we making sure our contracts are up to date and actually are being executed? You know, are providers in there the number of hours that we say that we're going to? Does the scheduling match? Does the online pieces? And seeing how all that impacts productivity. So with that, you can see on here, this is just a chart of like kind of how things, it starts all the way from strategy and goes all the way into how are you impacting the quality and the quality improvement of, of your overall um, community by having all of these different pieces go together instead of just focusing on one bucket of say productivity or financial performance. So with that, I did wanna leave a couple of minutes, um, Shannon, and we have some polling questions, I believe, and any questions that we have from the audience, but thank you for your time today. And hopefully we've shared with you some helpful information. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for your time, for for sharing your knowledge and, and your expertise with us today. I also want to thank the, the audience for your time and participation as well as I know it can get hard to carve out this time with your busy schedules. So as Ms. Opal indicated, if you have any questions, please feel free to add them into the chat box or come off mute if you dialed in, please press star six. So we do have four polling questions that we would like you to answer before we conclude today's session. Just as earlier, your response options are gonna range from confident all the way down to unconfident. As a reminder, all webinar presentations and the whole webinar series of the recordings 
will be available shortly after today's webinar and they'll be housed on the center's website. As for those that would like the continuing education credits, Caleb will be sending out the email shortly after today's session, um, which you may fill out. Also in that follow-up email, there'll be a survey that we encourage everybody to participate in. It should only take a couple minutes, just so we at the center can get a general pulse on how you felt the webinar series went. This really helps us better understand the needs from our participants. We do hope that you found our financial sessions beneficial. And as always, please feel free to reach out to the center with any additional questions. And at this time, Ms. Opal, I do not see anything in the chat box. Does anybody have any closing comments or questions? All right, well, on that note, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye.